And uh, we're going to talk about this thing we've got coming up, which is the Founder Institute. So are you ready for that? We got, we're about 20 minutes in. We're about at that right spot. You got paper out, pencil, can take notes. This is one of the most exciting things I've ever seen to come along, and I don't want to steal any of that. But uh, what I want to do is, ladies and gentlemen, I want to introduce uh, Jason Primo, and he's going to tell you more about himself. I'm going to flip slides, but you should applaud right now. <laughs> all right, it's all yours. <laughs> all right, Jason Primo here to talk to you about the uh, Founder Institute, but let, let me uh, give you some background real quick. Um, so I start, I'm an accidental entrepreneur, uh, came out of Georgia Tech as a design engineer, had a couple engineering degrees, had no idea what entrepreneurs did. I thought they were people that can't get real jobs and start, off, start up flower shops or something because they can't get a Fortune 500 logo on their business card. Um, my whole world consisted of either two types of people, um, family members that graduated college and went to work literally at one place and retired. Uh, no joke, one place and retired. Um, the other was strong military, so they went into the military and retired, and that was it. And I would have done that, too, if my eyesight had, had not gone bad in high school. I'd be a fighter pilot right now. But I became, uh, went into Fortune 500, um, learned a lot. I did learn a lot, worked for a great company, got to travel all the world, not bad from a, for a country hick from, from Georgia. Got to learn a lot about, about good beer uh, in Europe. Um, but I did learn a lot, and through really some good mentorship, I got kind of nudged. Uh, into, into entrepreneurship um, via private equity and, event and eventually doing my own things um, here in Greenville. And uh, my most recent adventure was the uh, acquisition of a small mom and pop machine shop in 2002. And uh, that's what it looked like. Machine shops basically transform blocks of metal into the, the parts that go into all the things we use, uh, including uh, um, consumer goods and aircraft, but this is kind of what we, we start started with. So being a, being a lean manufacturing guy and having a lot of process expertise, we like to transform things. But that's that's kind of what we started with in 2007. Did not have the recession on the business plan, um, but we were able to weather through that because we had we had a pretty good recipe. We invested a lot in the people, processes, and uh, technologies. We put a lot of our own skin in the game. Pretty much bet the farm. Um, got some local investors, got an SBA loan, and uh, cobbled a business plan together, and off we go. Um, this is what we transformed into. Eventually became a top aerospace supplier, uh, including to Boeing. Um, and fast forward now, as of now, basically there's not a, a Boeing aircraft that's manufactured without parts from South Carolina. So 737 all the way up to the Dreamliner. Um, and uh, mo actually most of the components go out to Seattle because that's where they assemble most of the planes. Um, so how about that? Uh, not a Boeing aircraft flies without stuff here from South Carolina. Pretty cool. Um, this is actually, that's actually, uh, it's kind of bright, but um, that's, that's the most important door to the uh, crew, which is the escape hatch door <laughs> in, the, uh, in the pilot uh, area in the cockpit. Um, so you can see the, uh, the teams there. During that time, average wages rose from about $15 an hour to $25, $26. I see Dolph over there. He was been in the factory several times. So anyway, that's just a little bit of background, background on me. Um, about to show you a scary slide. Be, be prepared. Don't, make sure you don't have food in your mouth. I'm going to show you a slide of what the percentage of folks living in the state of poverty, according to uh, stats by the U.S. government, um, looks like today. It's going to be a little time elapsed video from the early 2000s to about 2012 is when we have the, the correct data. And I want you to really key in on the southeast area. And um, uh, basically, red is bad. Um, so look, just watch, watch it evolve a little bit. So 2010, 2012, 1998, 2003, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. What's happening? Any rocket scientists out there can tell us what's happening to the percentage of people in poverty in the Southeast? What's happening? What's the trend look like? It's getting worse. It looks like, Miles, you're in a really good business. So in the Southeast, a lot of areas are over literally 30%. Um, that's county by county in a state of poverty. So translation is our traditional method, our traditional thought. What I grew up with is 
go to college, get your four-year degree, punch the ticket, go get a job at a Fortune 500, and you're safe. Um, that might be a little obsolete uh, right now. And most people are staring at a really uncertain future. Most are not going to get a good job. And my personal thought is you're probably not going to get a very good job at that. Because it's going to be a, in, in a lot of areas, it's going to be a, a buyer's market. Unless you have a, a coveted technology degree where there's severe shortages. And there are, and there are gaps. Um, this is what most of us deal with when we go to work for somebody. It doesn't matter how well we do. Um, the system sets the bar so that it pleases everyone. Hey, it doesn't matter if you do 10 times better than your coworker. You're looking at a 2.5% raise, which I don't know where they get this cost of living increase number. Because when I look at consumer goods and the stuff I buy in the grocery store, I just do not see that going up 2.5%, 3, 3% every year. I see it going up 7 8 10%. Amazing how they... Amazing how they create their own formulas to get the numbers they want. So this is the reality. So you can kind of see why entrepreneurship is kind of in vogue lately, right? So, but before you tell your job to, um, and quit your day job and launch your career, um, the statistics are bad. If you don't know, startups um, don't really do that well statistically. Most, most folks that launch their own startup are out of business within a year, 18 months. I think Forbes... Um, uh, actually, I read that on uh, Joe's blog there at 5W. Forbes study showed about 75, 80% of people that start their own business flame out in less than 18 months. So the stats are not, are not very good. Um, a lot of us think that, hell, the dream of entrepreneurship is great. You know, I get to set my own schedule. It's going to be margaritas by the pool. I'm going to have this four-hour work week, right? Get to design, sell stuff from home on the Internet. It's going to be great. It's going to be great. The reality is entrepreneurship is really hard, and ideas are the easy part. Running a company and all the boring stuff that you have to do to successfully run a company really sucks. It's really hard. It's very, very demanding. It's demanding not on you, but on your family as well. The divorce rates for entrepreneurs are a lot higher. Um, that's the reality. Um, so four-hour work week, you, it's not. It's you're not going to have it. I think the joke we use is you can, you can work half days, pick which 12 hours. And really, that's, that's an easy, that's the easy side of it. I'd be shocked if, if you could work 12 hours a day. You, man, you are, you've really got a great recipe. Um, so I had a beer with Elon in 2010. And uh, that's pretty cool, by the way. Um, but uh, I liked his quote that he said in the, uh, in the Founder Showcase. This is the reality. It's like walking on coals and eating glass at the same time. It is hard. Ideas are the easy part. Running a business is really, really hard. And while we go, there's great schools that we go to. I mean, I had a great, great education at Georgia Tech, learned a lot, did not know a thing about running a company. And even when I was working at Fortune 500, I moved into production management. I was managing a $100 million operation when I was 27 years old, several hundred people doing great. I didn't even know what a balance sheet was. I couldn't read about it. You don't learn these things when you go to school or even when you go to work for somebody. There's great people that run large, large organizations, could not entrepreneur their way out of a paper bag um, without all the resources um, that they have in their company. It's really, really hard to run your own business. But when you talk to local startups, um, and this is really everywhere. I know we hear about this a lot in, in our area. It makes a lot of headlines. Um, but I mean, I'm in Austin, Texas. I'm in Silicon Valley. I'm in New York. I'm in Boston. I'm heading out to Texas again here Friday. It's, everybody says the same thing. You talk to folks like, what's holding you back? Um, why aren't our startups succeeding? What's wrong with our ecosystem? Everybody says lack of capital. That's usually the common thing. Oh, if we just had more money in the community. Oh, we just have everything solved. If I could just have more money for my startup, we could really get this thing off the ground. It's really the wrong headline. It, it, we do not have a lack of capital problem. And Dolph, you could quote me. We do not have a lack of capital problem. We have more money than can ever be invested. We do not have a lack of capital problem. Access to capital is getting harder, though. There's tons of money out there, but it is getting harder to obtain. And the landscape is changing. 
And, and generally, when you're looking at a startup or if you're looking at your trajectory, um, there are more levels. But in your near-term future, you're looking at three levels of funding. The first one is called FFF. Anybody knows, knows what that stands for? Friends, Family, and Fools. You, these are folks that will, this is your family, this is your friends, this is your credit cards. Most people can kind of cobble together 25, 50K worth of startup costs. So go get, you can get three or four credit cards and max them out, and there you got 50K. That's what most people do. You, you can have an idea. You can have a PowerPoint presentation, and you can probably get 25K. Your uncle, your aunt, your grandmother, they'll, they'll give you 10K. Just funny, you're, I, it's a great idea. You're going to be great at it. Those days are over. Getting your idea funded is over. If you have an idea, if you have a patent, it doesn't matter. Nobody cares about your patent. Nobody cares about your idea. They care, can you execute? Are you the right person? Hey, that's a great idea, but that's a, that's a super idea. But what makes you the right person to lead that idea? So it's becoming a lot harder. So most people get, during this class, they get their 25, 50K, and then they seek angel investment. And, and everything's moving upstream. It used to be a lot easier. Now it's the, the hurdles are becoming a lot harder. You talk to an angel investor, and the classical definition is anything north of that, 50 to 1.5 million. Um, and, and you're typically 500 to 1.5 million. But even that's changing. Even, even the amount of angel investing is now doubling that. Now you're seeing angel rounds looking like VC rounds. You're seeing two, three, four million dollars invested around the country in startups, but they want to see a lot more. Um, they're going to be a lot more demanding. Are you working full time in that job? Have you really, really refined your idea to the point where you can launch this and you're working full time in it? There may be at least one of you um, in it if you've got a team. Do you have domain expertise? Do you know anything about the industry? Have you sold in that industry? What makes you so special to lead the charge in that in that domain? How is this integrated into your life experience? Or, or are you just getting started and you're going to figure it out? Um, do you have a functioning prototype? The days of investing in a PowerPoint presentation or a picture is gone. You better have a hacked out prototype that at least can, you can kind of demonstrate. It doesn't have to be perfect, but it, it, you've got to prove it out. Just, hey, it, it, as soon as I get the money, then I'll go make a prototype. It's gone. Over. Very, very rare. Very rare. I don't care if you have a patent. It doesn't matter. The other things comes into play in the VC world. When, you, when you're getting into VC money, now 1.5, you, now you're out of the garage and you need to scale up and hire a bunch of people and get your brick and mortar. Extremely demand. There's more money. There's a boatload more money out there for you, 10 times more than there used to be, but the demands are a lot harder. So the access to capital is getting more challenging, but there's a lot more capital out there. So how can you get a piece of that? What's the real limiting factor in startups not succeeding and an ecosystem that we want to create here in the upstate? Why is it? Well, this is a great book if you haven't read it. You need to check this guy out. Super um, incredible um, uh, thought, thought leadership here. Fragmentation kills entrepreneurship. What does that mean, fragmentation? This is what we kind of envision our ecosystem when We've got a startup, we've got this great community, great, we've got events like this, we've got um, grants, we've got, um, we've got accelerators, incubators, we've got people that can help, we've got business loans. This is what we kind of envision is in our, is in our ecosystem. So a startup can move in and then they can kind of plug in and there's enough resources there to kind of shepherd the, the startup through the process. The reality is this is kind of what it looks like. It's very chaotic. There's a lot of organizations with three and four letter acronyms, have no idea what they mean. It looks like they all kind of say the same thing. How do I get engaged? Who does what? What level? Um, why can't I get a loan? Um, it, it's hard for uh, a startup to navigate this really complex maze. And during that time you're trying to navigate, you're burning your very valuable gasoline in your tank. You have a very limited tank with fuel in it. And every time you take a turn, and every time you go over a hill, you use a little bit more. So if it takes you a little longer to figure out who does what, to link up with the right people, you could run out of gas before you get there. And this is what often happens. You, 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 end up, you may find the right people, the right allies, the right partners, but you find them towards the end, and you just run out of gas. And a lot of startups run out of gas. It's not because they had a crappy idea. Just the execution, they just ran out of gas. So... 
here's our pitch. The Founder Institute is an idea accelerator. Idea accelerator. It is from Silicon Valley, um, but it's made portable. Um, it's meant to globalize some of, the, some of the best practices. And it helps aspiring entrepreneurs create high impact companies. That's the real focus, high impact companies. If you're wanting to start your own company and you want to be a million and two in sales and the whole reason you're starting up your startup is to, is to create a job for yourself, we don't want to help you. Um, we, need, we need people that are starting up enduring meaningful companies that make a big impact in their local economy, make a, make a big boom in their economy, create a lot of jobs, move the needle. We need more high impact headquartered companies in South Carolina is what we need. God bless our Fortune 500 companies. I love reading about the expansions of BMW, but the bottom line is somebody here on a four-year rotation that's going to go back or move somewhere is not going to be, it doesn't matter how great they are during, while they're here, they're not going to be entrenched in our ecosystem like somebody who started up something from here from the, from the ground up and has been here for 20 years. A headquartered company in your hometown or state is worth gold. It's worth 10 of those Fortune 500 companies. And the level that people are involved in the community and on boards of charities and giving is enormous, enormous. Even the small companies are typically contributing and doing more than some of the large ones. So the, the Founder Institute, you saw a picture of Elon. Well, just to give you a little background story, he and his uh, college roommate um, at University of Pennsylvania, um, Adeo Resi, so when they got out of college, they invested, they co-invested, did a, a lot of startups. Some obviously did very well. Um, some did not, uh, way before the Tesla and, and SpaceX days. Um, so they took a look at, well, why, why did those investments go poorly? Why, why did those startups flame out? What, what are the root causes? Is it because their, their ideas are crummy? What, what was the root causes? And they started investigating that. Um, quite a lot and found that it was really execution skills. There's a lot of rookie mistakes that we make when we make that leap from employee to entrepreneurship. And what if we could, what if we could mitigate those risks? What if we could, what if we could teach people um, those things so they weren't just learning trial by fire? What if people could launch their startup with all those lessons learned from the get-go? And they, so they started that, that, that program. Adeo was the one that really, uh, A-D-E-O, Adeo Ressi, he's the one that really took it and ran with it. Um, very, very successful in Silicon Valley. So they started expanding it using, uh, with, with their friends and network up, up the West Coast. Then more people started asking, hey, that's, uh, that stuff's pretty good. Uh, how about, uh, we'd love to bring this over to Seattle or, or Boston. Well, that's a pretty good idea. How do we make this thing portable so that um, it's not just a Silicon Valley thing? It doesn't only apply towards just tech and, 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 and software. We want to grow tech, but there's a lot more happening state by state than just one, one demographic. So what if we could make this portable and universal so that any city around the country and world, if they wanted to create their own ecosystem and help new aspiring entrepreneurs, they, they could and literally kind of give it away. But what, what is an idea accelerator? Um, it fits really kind of at the early stage. So this is where the Founder Institute sits. It's an idea accelerator. So you have events like this where you get really smart, like-minded people together and you see the sparks fly and then people come up with ideas, but then what do you do with it? And maybe you're not a, a three kids coming out of college um, with your MBA and you can still live, live at your parents' home in the basement. You know, what if you have a mortgage, a family, um, bills to pay? You can't necessarily just quit your job and move into a, a co-work space or an accelerator um, like a lot of places. Um, a lot of us have day jobs, and, and we also, we may not be cut out to be entrepreneurs. Um, so maybe before we max out our credit cards, mortgage the house, quit our day job to go spend money on that $25,000, $30,000 patent to then learn, oh, that was a bad idea. Nobody's going to buy that. That's, some, that's a really bad mistake to make. So we would like to avoid those kinds of issues. We want to be an ideal accelerator. And then people coming out of that are really, really set up for success. You're set up for success. You're well-rounded. Um, you've got wisdom surrounded you. You're set up properly legal, legally, um, financially. Now, you, now when you move into the Iron Yard or you go to Y Combinator or any other co-work space, for example, um, you're, you're not just paying the rent. You, you've, you've really got your act together. And you're different than the majority of people on stage just pitching a PowerPoint. So that's, that's kind of the continuum, and eventually it sets you up for success for, for angel funding. 
Um, but that's where an idea, that's what an idea accelerator is. You heard me say this again. I'll say this over and over again. For God's sakes, keep your day job. For God's sakes, keep your day job. Do not quit your job. Doesn't matter how cool your idea is. Doesn't matter how awesome it's going. Oh, all we got to do is just get one half percent of that Chinese market, and we'll all be billionaires. Um, do not quit your day job. It's set up. It's set up for people who have a lot of obligations. It's an after-work program. Um, that provides a formal curriculum over a 14-week period that teaches you all the elements about how to run a business. Ideas are the easy part. You do spend time on your idea and refining your idea, but 90% of what you learn is how to turn that idea and sell and make money. It doesn't, I don't care about your passion. Um, how do you make money? How do you make money for you, your employees, and your investors? Um, if you don't make money, you're going to run out of gas, and then nobody's going to hear about your idea. So there, is, um, there, there are after-hours um, classes that are taught so that you can keep your day job. There is a boatload of homework that you do individually and also in team settings as well, and then you're interacting with a lot of mentorship. And quite frankly, it's meant to weed you out. Founder Institute is not, doesn't operate like a traditional for-profit. They're not out to make money on classes and create uh, bloated overhead jobs for people teaching stuff. They don't care. They don't care if anybody graduates. Um, and the bulk of people don't graduate. Um, only, only about uh, 40, 50 percent of the people that get into the program actually make it out. It's meant to make you a Navy SEAL because the statistics are really bad for startups. So before you waste all your money and, and lose your home, let's test this first before you make that leap. So, but that's the high level. There is, um, there's, it's a lot of work. It's like an MBA plan on steroids, but it's meant to teach you how to run a company. Um, these are some of the ingredients. There definitely are weekly sessions. There's workshops. Um, there's a lot of interaction with mentorship, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, there is a lot of tools and templates, things that you would normally have to figure out along the way. Um, the, the companies um, that have done very, very well Throughout the, throughout the programs over the years, all those best practices are, are captured. So when you're in the program, you have access to all those best practices world, worldwide, from legal documents to um, team management to HR skills, all the things that normally you'd have to pay a lot of money for, and then you don't even know if you're getting something that's good. Um, you know, here you get something that um, uh, you know, Reed Hoffman used at LinkedIn. Like Here's his exact you know, system that he used. You get that kind of stuff. Um, that's really, really powerful. And it can save you a lot of money, too. So that way you can keep your money in and put it towards your product um, versus wasting it on non-value added, added things. Um, these are the 14 different sessions um, that, are, that are covered. These are the things that you, you learn. Obviously, there's a lot of deep dive, you know, really, really deep in the weeds teaching you how to do it. This is not a luncheon where you hear somebody talk and blah, blah, blah. Oh, that's great. I got a golden nugget. All right. No, this is, gets really, really in the weeds. Um, it's a lot of work. Um, it is non-academic. Um, no offense to our friends in academia, we need them, but you need to learn from people who have, number one, made mistakes, who have run companies, who have had to make payroll, who have sacrificed paying themselves so that they could pay their employees' salaries, and have made it, and have sold companies. Those are the people you need to learn from. And if you're not learning from those folks, then, then you're not set up for success. And, and we have... We, we need more been there, done that mentorship. The, the access to capital is this much compared to the access to mentorship. Access to mentorship is what an ecosystem really needs. And if you're not an expert and you haven't, you know, you haven't been on both sides of a paycheck, receiving it and making it, then you, just, you need to shut up and stop mentoring people. You need to shut up. We need real mentors who have been in the trenches helping people. That's what you get, non-academic folks. Um, a lot of hands-on mentorship. So there are mentors that are involved in providing and relating the curriculum. The curriculum's proven, but you need to relate that to real-world experiences, and that's where mentors come in to relate. Hey, this is, a, this is the subject matter. We're covering this, but let me tell you how it worked in my business. And having three different mentors actually talk about that. So you need, you need some diversity uh, in, in perspectives, too. Here's what didn't work. Here's how I went out of business. Here's how I started that, and I went bankrupt, and I had to start over again. Those are the kinds of mentorship discussions that you have. Those are the kinds of people um, that you work with. 
Um, and speaking of mentors, um, we've got over 30, and they're very diverse. They're from all walks of life. Folks that have IT organizations, construction, marketing, um, aerospace, um, finance, uh, lots and lots of examples. Um, definitely a lot of folks in the, in the IT uh, group, but we have a lot of others as well. You need diversity. And just because you have an IT company doesn't mean you want um, five IT gurus on your board of advisors or in your company. You don't want everybody thinking and drinking the, the same Kool-Aid. You need outside perspectives. Um, the stronger, the more diverse your team is, the, the stronger your, your company will be. Those are just some, some of the mentors. Um, one of the other benefits is besides just leveraging local mentors, you get to plug into a global community. You're part of, a, of, of an elite uh, group. Uh, around the world that you get to access mentors and also similar graduates um, in the program. So folks like Elon Musk and Reid Hoffman and, and a lot of others in other industries as well, they're, they're part of the, of the program and they, you know, they want to give back, but they don't want to help just everybody who has a, an idea. They want to help people that are really serious and put in the work um, and to have access to really, really talented, bright people like that that can provide you uh, guidance, uh, open up a door for you is massive. It's, it's massive. That's one of the, really the undervalued uh, areas in an accelerator program. The results are good. There are a lot of success stories um, as a result of this experiment over the last few years. Um, it is now way beyond just Silicon Valley. It's in 100 different cities in about 50 different countries. I've been working three years to bring it to Greenville because it's not a franchise. I can't, doesn't matter how much money I throw at them, you can't buy your way um, into the Founder Institute because they don't, they, don't, they don't need your darn money. <laughs> They're already rich. They don't need your money. Um, so they, they care more about are people serious? Is the ecosystem, is the support there? Are, are people really going to do the work? Is the quality of people there to support the, um, the program? Um, now there's about 15, over 1,500 companies that have been launched over the last few years as a result. This is uh, worldwide. And the statistics are really, really good. It's phenomenal. Um, not everybody graduates, but those that do, the 1,500 that are making it, 86% of them are still alive and kicking. That is unbelievable. Just that alone. 86% of the companies that have gone through the Founder Institute are still alive, breathing, and kicking. Remember, it's, remember what we just said about Forbes? Forbes said 80% of the companies that start up flame out in 18 months or less. 70% are ahead of their financial projections. 45% of them have received some sort of significant funding. However, I will say that they're, they're actually looking at revising that number because when they went back and looked at a lot of the data, they found hmm, there's a lot of companies that are successful, but they actually didn't need funding. Guess what? A paying customer is the best source of funding that you can have. So just because you didn't get funding, raising money, hey, I raised a million dollars, that's not the litmus test for success. You know, making money, <laughs> I, I made profit, that's, that's what needs to be advertised a lot more. We, we give people a lot of headlines for, oh, so-and-so raised two million dollars, but yeah, but are they making any money? When are they gonna make money? Um, raising money is not the measure of success, and this will probably be, uh, be revised. But some companies do need, do need money, especially in capital, aerospace, and capital-intensive businesses. Warren Buffett as your uncle, you, you're going to need some help. Um, so, so raising money is, is very important for, for a lot of companies. So how, how? How do we do this? How do people with a, with a, I got a cool idea, but what do I do with it? And what if, I'm, what if I'm two smart guys at BMW, and I've got an idea for this gizmo, but yeah, it's not really not a fit for BMW. They're not going to do anything with it. Where do I go? Ooh, man, I've got a, I've got a mortgage. I, I can't just quit my job at BMW, but I really want to really want to see this thing through. Where do I go? How do I set up a startup? Uh, I've never learned about that. How do I set up a pro forma financial plan? How do I sell this? I don't know anything about it. I'm an engineer. How do, I, how do I sell this stuff? How do you get that off the whiteboard? It's not just a patent. You can't just go get a patent and, oh, I'm just going to go license this and get some royalties. It's not going to work. One out of a million. And guaranteed you're not going to be one of them. So what do you do? You can join. It's free to apply, um, and you may not get in. You may get your feelings hurt. Um, but if you do get in, you have access to a lot of, of resources. Um, keep your day job. <laughs> 
For God's sakes, don't quit your day job. This is designed for you. They specifically designed this program to tap into the, think about, think about Greenville Spartanburg Anderson. Think about how many really smart people we have working in, in jobs around the upstate. We're, actually, if you look at it in the country, we've got the highest concentration. If not one, it's either, we're either number one or number two, but highest concentration of scientists and engineers anywhere in the country. That's a lot of smart people like me who didn't learn anything about being an entrepreneur. And we would love for some of those folks to start up their own companies and not learn the hard way and become the next headquartered big thing here in the upstate. Um, you have to take an entrepreneur IQ test to get in. They've collected a lot of big data on this. It actually started as, uh, it had a lot more in traditional intelligence testing in it, but over the years, after, as they've collected data, they found that that wasn't statistically significant, that, that raw intelligence wasn't statistically linked to the companies that necessarily made it and were doing well and got funded, so they actually threw that out. What do they test for? So when you apply, you, you do have to take a test, and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's rigorous. Um, their goal is to weed people out. They don't want your money. They want the best, and they want to set you up for success. There's been 15,000 people that have taken this predictive test. It's very, very unique. Do you have entrepreneur DNA is really their main goal. And it's not a perfect test, but the data, it, it really backs up um, their, their position. So again, they've had two, two, over 2,000 uh, enrolled folks. Lots of companies have graduated. Um, this test, while not perfect, has an 85 to 86% confidence level that if you can pass this, um, then you've got the raw ingredients, you've got the material, what it takes um, to be a successful entrepreneur. It's not perfect, but it's pretty darn good. Um, these are the things that they actually test for. So even if you don't even start up your own company, it's pretty cool to have some feedback on areas that, based on your peers globally, um, these are areas that you exceed as a would-be potential startup entrepreneur. These are the areas that mm, you may not be ready for. Maybe you want to work on that before you quit your day job. So it's feedback. Um, fluid intelligence, the ability to recognize patterns and trends and do something about it. That's, that's real world business. Real world is not giving you a test with multiple choice and you just bubbling in something. Real world is giving you a blank sheet of paper and you have to actually determine what the problem is. We, we, we grow up going to school 18, 24, 30 years with the problem handed to us. Just solve this problem. The real world is nothing like that. Here's your business. What is the problem? That's what you really have to learn. We're totally taught the wrong way. Openness. Are you, once you do find a trend, are you able to change? Are you so stuck in your ways and so resistant to change? Are you open to new ideas and input, diversi diversification? Um, people who don't think like you, um, that's incredibly important. Collaboration. Um, unfortunately, we are graded individually most of our educational lives. Um, there are some educational programs that are getting a lot better at, at putting in kind of team projects, but we are far away from working in the real world. Most people, unless, you're, unless you got a golf club or a tennis racket, you're in a team sport, and that's the real world. You're going to be working with other people, and the measure of success is all of you um, school, putting points on the board. That's the real world. It also tests for bad DNA, too. Excuse making, deceit, narcissism, emotional instability. These are the things that they've tested that people may, be, may have a great idea, but because they have one or more of these traits, they're the wrong person to lead that startup and run it. They may need to be an individual contributor working for someone. The worst thing you can do is put somebody like this in charge of a company, no matter how great the idea is, no matter how much millions of dollars they've received in funding. So this is an example. Obviously, got some of the names blurred out, but this is kind of what some of the back office looks like. So when you're in the program and when mentors are working with you, instead of just going, instead of just cramming you all through the same process, it's, you know, what's Mr. Pa what, are, what are Mr. Palmer's strengths? What's his areas of development? And let me tailor our mentorship to help him because 
every single person is a case-by-case -case basis. We don't just follow the book and, okay, everybody go to chapter three, take the same test. Life is not like that. So mentors have this feedback. You can see Jim Bob here at the bottom probably isn't going to make it um, in the program. He's probably going to get cut. He's probably not going to graduate. There's going to be some areas that the mentors are going to focus on, but statistics usually show that when somebody starts to go red, then they get, they get cut from the program. It's a rigorous program. People will get their feelings hurt. I'd rather you have your feelings hurt than you go broke, get divorced, and not have a house and live in a shoebox. Scholarships. So the program is launching. Um, we've got the support. We've got the mentors. We've got the blessing of the Founder Institute. Um, now we're rolling out some scholarships. So um, there's some ways to... Um, there is a small, uh, you can go on the website, I gave that to you, you can learn a lot. They're very transparent, you can see everything that they do, all their requirements. Um, but there's some scholarships because uh, the Founders Institute also kind of targets very specific sectors in developing ecosystems. And I want to talk to you about a couple of them, but this one being number one. Um, this is how you learn about it. Go to fi.co, no M at the end, fi.co backslash fellowships. Go to that. You can learn all about them. I'm going to show you some highlights, but you can learn all about them. You can apply. It doesn't cost anything to apply. You might get your feelings hurt, but it'd be great to get feedback before you make that leap. Here's one, the Technical Founder Fellowship. And GSAT, GATC, and Phil specifically is one of the mentors. He's going to be involved in helping us award some of these um, scholarships. There's at least one in each of these categories, and there will probably be multiple of them. So the Technical Fellow... Um, technical fellowship, it's awarded to the most extraordinary applicant in the high-tech space. So out of the pool of applicants, there's going to be more, at, at least one awarded that. that in itself, so that kind of pays your way through the program. That's also an enormous amount of marketing, too. So, so just to make it into the fellowship is big. Then to receive a, a scholarship from the program, you can't buy that kind of marketing. You can't, sorry for any marketing folks, <laughs> you, you can't buy that kind of marketing when you receive um, that kind of uh, Award. So, so Phil and the G and GSATC, uh, we definitely want to um, we want to pull we want to pull from this pool of talent, and we want to you know make make your dreams come to uh, come to reality. Um, there's also a, 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 a one-time offering since we're a brand new chapter. Um, they give us a launch fellowship, which is also technology oriented as well. So this will, this will only happen for this semester, and then um, that, that fellowship will go away. But that's yet another kind of tech scholarship. There's also ones that focus on creating more female, woman-owned startups. In the cities that they've launched this, they've improved the number of female-led startups by over 60%. Um, and their goal is to do that here in Greenville, Spartanburg, Anderson. So if you are a female and want to start your dream, there's an avenue for you. If you are a veteran, similarly, this is a new one. That their goal is to duplicate the success they've seen in the cities they've launched the Female Founder Fellowship. So if you are a veteran, great. You know, there's avenues for you to get back into the workforce. But how about create your own job? And if actually, if anybody's more qualified to go through the rigors of uh, starting up in the chaos of, of uh, a brand new company, probably the veterans are the most prepared. So we really want to see um, veterans get involved. Uh, and then my angel group is sponsoring um, a, a new one for the Founder Institute, a, a diversity minority um, fellowship as well. And there was a press release uh, on that recently. So, and there'll be more, uh, where there's several large companies in, in interested in kind of uh, um, sponsoring their own uh, fellowships, but those are the ones that are live now. So I'm here for a call to action. This is my purpose here. Definitely want to provide some information and entertain you, but I really want you to do something. Um, the goal of the Founder Institute is to, is to really provide the resources you need, is to lower the barrier of entry for people that have an idea but don't know where to go. Just going into a, a co-work space, I love camping out at the Next Innovation Center. It's awesome. I love it. Um, but just camping out there and having a cool place doesn't teach you how to run a company. Um, you need more than just a co-work space. Um, you need an ecosystem. So we, we really want to provide the combination of curriculum, mentors from the local area, mentors from outside, the resources, because it does take a city to raise a startup. It's, it's very, very hard for one person 
to do it alone. You should not be alone. You don't have to be alone. What if you didn't have to be alone? What if you had a whole army behind you, helping you along the way? It is a very lonely journey um, making the leap. A lot of your friends won't understand. Your family won't understand. They may scoff and roll their eyes. It's a lonely journey. It's very important to surround yourself with people that understand where, what your journey looks like. They can relate to you, and they can provide you real world advice from the trenches. So attend events like this, let the sparks fly, but do something. We need to increase the number of entrepreneurship in our ecosystem. We need more companies that become headquartered and birthed and become the next big thing in the upstate. So collaborate. We need people to get together with like-minded like ideas and maybe talents. Maybe, maybe you know how to sell. You've got the idea and you've got the back office. Put it together. Um, you don't have to know how to do everything. Join, whether, it, whether it's the Founder Institute or something, learn, join something and learn. Don't just make the leap and figure it out. You will run out of gas. The statistics worldwide for decades show you will not make it. Learn something before you make that leap. For those of you that have been involved in running businesses, be a mentor. Get involved in a mentor. Now, now there's a platform for you to plug in and not just attend committee meetings and things like that. What I find is the, the smartest folks to be, out, uh, to be mentors get asked to do a lot. Yeah, the, the, the mentors in our communities, they get asked over and over again. We keep going to the same people. Will you join this board? Will you join that? And what the feedback I get is, man, I, there's all these people that are trying, they're asking me to do stuff, but man, I, I need to attend another committee meeting like I need a hole in the head. And what I really am passionate about is I want to spend my time mentoring, not going through minutes and notes and meetings. I want to spend my time mentoring, helping people start up companies, not sitting in and eating lunch and having a meeting with several other people pontificating. So we need a platform where people, where smart people who are mentors, who have been there, done that, can spend 99.9% .9 of their time mentoring. And that's what they love to do. And we hope that this will get more mentors out of the woodwork because we got a lot of smart people in the state of South Carolina. We've got a lot of very, very successful people. And they've got plenty of money, but time is their most valuable resource. And we want to make sure that, that um, they wisely use their time. So now is the time to get involved. I gave you some information. Um, you can learn more on the website. Um, fi.co and some of those other hyperlinks, but you can also send me an uh, email at primo at primoventures.com and I will respond. Do I have time for questions? All right. Yes, it's okay. Applaud. <laughs> Any questions? Yes, sir. So you want, um, so yeah, you, you learn a lot about that in the founders, including legal structure. Um, I, to be frank, I've been screwed out of millions of dollars because I did not know what I didn't know. And I learned, I learned a lot <laughs> now, but with the Founder Institute, you get all of that. So here's the legal structure, here's the operating agreement, um, here are protective provisions, here's how to keep founders from getting screwed while, while still helping investors. Um, you're usually dealing with investors that deal with term sheets and operating agreements all day long. You're putting together one. These guys look at 20 a day. They will, even if they're not wired to take advantage of it, they're still wired to get a good deal. Um, so you go in to that at an extreme disadvantage. So just, I wanted to predicate that going in. That, that should, I'm trying to scare you to death because you do need to be scared. You will, I've been screwed out of millions of dollars. Um, because of that. Don't make my mistake. This is how you can do it. So what kind of company are you creating? Just in general. I don't want to know. What, how big do you want to be? Huge. Huge. Okay. Um, uh, are, what, uh, so you're, you're already down the path. What are you about to pull the trigger on? Are you going to be a South Carolina LLC or? Totally not investable. I don't care about your idea. I would just push your pitch deck right over here to the side. Okay. Need to be a Delaware C Corp because yep. you're not going to be able to raise real money. If you want to be an endearing, high-impact company, is a company that's going to be north of 20 million bucks. 
If you aren't going to be north than $20 million, then you're a lifestyle business. Um, or you need to be in that range. You know, we'll take a good $15 million company with a high EBITDA. Um, if you want to create a real high-impact company that's going places, you're probably going to need, unless you have Warren Buffett, unless you're just minting money, you're going to need to raise funds. The, the majority of the people that put real money to work are going, they have all their legal structure set up. This is how they do business. Um, they don't want to force a square peg in a round hole. And the fact is, we invest in Delaware C Corps because that's our legal, our legal team knows that. We know the mechanics. That's what we want. Um, do not set up a South Carolina LLC. Doesn't do anything. Okay. It doesn't matter. Uh, well, the South Carolina doesn't get $149. Okay. <laughs> cool. Thank you. But I can set up a Delaware C Corp. I can invest in that. As long as it's headquartered, I'm creating jobs in South Carolina, I will get all the angel tax credit. Any other questions? Facebook started as a Florida LLC, by the way. They converted that real quick because <laughs> investors weren't going to give them a dime. Yes, ma'am. Well, again, this is our first semester, so this is brand new here. In my experience, though, being a part of the Founder Institute, just being involved, um, you know, it kind of depends. Um, honestly, it depends on the region that it's starting up. It depends on the ecosystem. Um, what are the strengths of the community? If you take a look at the upstate, for example, we got 20% of our GDP in, in manufacturing. So, yes, there are other industries and clusters we want to develop, but it would be really not prudent to not do something to help stimulate more manufacturing type startups. So you kind of take a look at the assets that you have in your region, the smart people that exist, your talent pool, because if you've got the best idea in the world, where are you gonna get the people to scale up? Let's say you do get $5 million of VC, your A round funding, okay. You gonna recruit, from, recruit everybody from all over the planet? So it, it depends on the ecosystem. Um, and there's, obviously there's things you want to develop. You don't want to only limit yourself to the, the box that you live in. Um, but it's hard to uh, do something where there's just absolutely a, a ghost town uh, that exists. Well, while, so being Silicon Valley is not the recipe that they're prescribing. Um, but you can take the best practices of running a company and you can make that portable. So if, it's, if your raw talent is in manufacturing and the people that have wealth and will invest are from manufacturing, they know manufacturing, they're like, well, software, I don't understand these bits and bytes, but you just create a product here, I can put my, well, I'll give you 10 million for that. So you wanna recognize that. So it, it depends, but there are best practices that have proven to be portable regardless. I mean, in, in different countries around the planet. Next question. How, many time, how much time do we have, Phil? Take one more. All right. One more question. Anybody brave enough to? Uh... Right, I'll be brave if they want me. Brave. <laughs> I mean, so just out of curiosity, I mean, you didn't cover. There's a there's a fee. It's not much, but there's a small fee involved. Why don't you oh yeah, there there is a seven fifty, uh, seven hundred fifty dollar entrance fee because they don't want tire kickers. Um, they're not looking for tens of thousands of dollars and things like that, like other accelerators. So it's crazy cheap, but they there is an entrance fee, and that's that's the cost. Yeah, and that that to me, I felt like that was sort of like signaling on their part, just like you said. I mean, that's not high enough that's going to keep someone at serious out, but it's low enough that there's something in the game for them. Yeah, I mean, they don't want people just showing up and kicking tires, but they, they don't need your money. Um, it's not a franchise. They're not out to make a pro They want to create companies that make an impact in ecosystems. So their, their goal is to create thousands of companies. Okay. And then why don't you cover just kind of where the schedule is. So you've got a couple more information sessions coming up, and then oh, you've yeah. got it, and then there's a... Uh, there's a deadline for application and all that kind of stuff. Talk yeah, um, so right now the, let's see. Uh, I don't remember seeing that up there, but I didn't mean to, for this to be a pop quiz for you. Uh, the, oh, wait a minute, I'm going to go this way. So before we get into the um, actual curriculum, this starts the week after July 4th. I think it's July 7th or something like that, whatever that Monday is. Um, there will probably be on the, the Monday evenings, but then there are things you do during the week. Um, leading up until July, there are a number of other information sessions which give you a small flavor 
of the types of things you'll, you will learn. Um, so there's little micro sessions where a few of the mentors will, will come up, talk about their story, about how they made the leap from employee to entrepreneur. Um, they may talk about uh, a certain theme. It could be about fundraising. Um, so you heard from, for example, Brian McSherry the other uh, time and a few folks in one of the Founder Institute sessions where he went to 56 or 55 different um, banks and investors trying to raise money for his, when they were carving out sage out of Millican. And it was the 56th uh, one that, that, that latched on. So you hear, you hear stories like that from the trenches. You hear about, a lot about failure. Um, and you learn a little bit about the subject matter. So there'll be several more of those. Uh, there are a few info sessions that, di that dive a little deeper into the curriculum and what you learn and how you engage and a lot of Q&A. Um, but it's meant to kind of arm people with getting you ready um, if, if you were to make that leap, what, what, what's in store for you. And um, you go to fi.co and um, you'll see, oh, I don't have internet connected here, otherwise I'd show you. Um, but you'll see all the different uh, cities and countries engaged. You can click on Greenville and you'll see the schedule there. So you'll see this session's coming up. Uh, there's an info session next Wednesday at 6 p.m. at the next Innovation Center. And then there are others um, scheduled as well. fi.co and you'll see everything there. Awesome. Very Ladies good. and gentlemen, round of applause for Jason Freeman. So Jason, you just finished talking in front of the GSATC lunch. Thanks for doing that. Yeah, thanks for having me. I mean, the whole idea of trying to create and help people found their own ventures. I mean, that's what you're about, right? Yeah, well, this is an idea accelerator. So a lot of people may have the beginnings of an idea, but it's not really fleshed out yet. And before they quit their day job and mortgage their house and run up their credit card bills, it would be best to re refine that idea and also be kind of shepherded through the process surrounded by mentors who have been there, done that, and made, made mistakes. So you can leverage all of that, all at the same time with a proven curriculum that teaches you how to turn an idea into a profit-making company. And, and it's been proven over you know, thousands of companies and hundreds of cities worldwide. Yeah, and the, the thing I love is even today, I mean, we heard some great ideas in the room. There are people that have got some really cool stuff but they obviously need this to get it to the next Ideas step. are the easy part. Yeah. Ideas don't get funded. Um, solid plans that show the investor how you execute and how you can successfully that. run a company, those, that's what gets funded. Yeah, that's what gets funded. And running right. a company is really hard. Yeah, <laughs> you, you said that enough. You know, your job was to scare them off. It I was. think you did that it excellently. Was. Not everybody's cut out to be an entrepreneur, it's not the four hour work week and sipping margaritas by the pool. You're gonna work harder than you've ever done before. And, and not everybody has that, that DNA. And it's best to kind of figure that out or to know what you, what you need to work on first before you quit your day job. Because you, you may need to keep it. Yeah, longer than you thought. Longer than you thought. That's really That's right. the issue. All right, Th I just want to say A, thanks. And of course we want to make sure that we get everybody to go over to fi.co in order to sign up because this thing begins in July and we need to get people through the process and see if they're gonna apply for those fellowships because we wanna award all of those fellowships before then. It's great, it's great, it's a free ride and it's great marketing to just number one, get into the Founder Institute because not everybody can get in, but then to be selected for one of these prestigious fellowships, that's uh, that's kind of marketing you can't buy for your, your startup. Absolutely, it's not just the fact that you've gotten the fellowship and the, the money associated that you won't be spending, but the idea that you can be able to tell people that you were awarded that and, over everybody else. And angel investors and VCs recognize the talent that comes out of the Founder Institute. So just, just applying and getting in uh, attracts investors, but then to receive a, uh, a fellowship um, out of an even smaller pool, that, that could be very valuable when, you do, when you're ready to go get funding. All right, we're gonna get them signed up. Thanks again. Very good, thanks for having me. Yep.